that's a problem that people run into is they say, well, I got a 16 inch conversion that runs this stuff, no problem. And then I built a dedicated upper with a 4.5 inch, you know, to keep everything subsonic on my can and nothing cycles. Well, it's because your barrel is so much shorter that you're not getting nearly as much impulse on the bolt. So you need to lighten the bolt weight up a little bit. Hi, everybody. My uh, good friend, still good friend, for what it's worth, by the way, not not fighting. Uh, Mark has handed the reins over to me today. You got Jimmy on the mic. Mark is joining me. And then across from us, virtually, on the big screen, thanks to MC Ryan setting all this tech up, is Will McNeil. Um, so he is joining us because we're talking about a really fun topic today. One that, uh, one that I was personally a very integral, or I, I guess not integral, but I was very much... Uh, involved with recently. You were like, Mark, we have to do this. These are amazing. Right, because I was personally, you know, I was interested in it myself. Right. And uh, so the the firearm, there's one firearm and an up around the table, uh, AR platform. And uh, these, even though they look like your regular 223 or, or 556 AR setups, they're actually 22 LR setups. And um, so just a quick backstory, and then we'll get into Will's intro here. Uh, cause I'm sure he's got a lot of exciting stuff to talk about, but, um, I was, I was really, I love shooting and I was thinking to myself, well, you know, okay, we have a spot that, uh, that I can shoot at where, uh, it's not a ton of space, but it's enough space you can safely shoot. And, uh, it's also though kind of surrounded by neighbors and stuff. So I was thinking it'd be nice to be able to shoot a carbine and not make a ton of noise. Also shoot a lot for not, you know, relatively that expensive. Uh, so Everybody makes an AR chambered in anything you can imagine. There's got to be one in 22, and sure enough, there were, but there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. I'm sure we'll get into that. The route I went, uh, I got the AR in, and I started realizing, you know, well, maybe there's some ways that I can make this thing a little bit more reliable. That's kind of one of the big things around, you know, anytime you see a 22 chambered in something a little bit odd, everyone's going to talk about how reliable is it. Um, so anyways, I found uh, a website online. Uh, via, I think, like a forum, recommendations, clicking around, link after link, uh, and it was Will's website. So, uh, Will, um, introduce yourself to our listeners and what you do and, and, and how you basically make these things run better. Sure. So, I founded Boar Buddy about three years ago now, um, and the original purpose was to make my own AR run, because uh, it just didn't out of the box. A um, little bit of a I guess a backstory was I was living in California at the time. And so I got into the 22 long rifle because of all the web of compliance issues with center fires there. Hmm. Um, and 22 is basically just bypass that. So I started with a conversion kit from CMMG and that was great, but the accuracy was a little subpar with the, the long jump to the rifling and the wrong twist and all of those factors. So then I quickly moved on about two weeks later to a, a dedicated upper and had all kinds of different problems. Um, my background is in mechanical engineering. And so I just started tinkering and designing and trying to fix my own problems. And one thing led to the next. And, and now I've essentially solved most of the, the large problems with reliability on this platform um, and, and then offer those to the, the greater public, um, kind of sharing my designs and, and my solutions with uh, the world has been, it's been a lot of fun. Um, it's been an interesting career change, um, to say the least. <laughs> I still do, I still do the engineering, but it's kind of hard to find time for the engineering now with all of the the activities with Boar Buddy. So that's exciting. It's been great. Yeah, that's yeah. A, that sounds like a great thing. That's really cool. You know, and and yeah. There must be a lot more people other than, you know, obviously just me. I'm sure there are uh, getting 22 ARs and stuff like that, realizing the same benefits that I was kind of after with just the fact that, I mean, it's first off, unbelievably fun. Anytime you throw a 22 in anything, it's just going to be a ton of fun. But, you know, like I said, it's inexpensive. You can get these things now, thanks to you uh, and and other folks like yourself. But uh, but you in big part, you can get them to run really well. Um, still enjoy the same basic platform you use when you do step it up to the center fire cartridges. It's, it's great. Yeah, abs- absolutely. Um, I, I find, actually find myself not really shooting center fire much anymore. As soon as I got that dedicated upper and I got the hassles of, of all the failures to feed failures to fire worked out, I hardly ever grab anything in, in 223 or 300 blackout, or even though I've got a bunch of that stuff on the shelf, just because it's, 
so much fun to shoot 22s and it's a little quieter a little less expensive for, for sure, sure. So I, no complaints yeah. i mean i know when it comes to just like straight like hey let's go shooting for me the 22 like whether right. it's like trying to do you know extend your effective range with the 22 or have it in carbine like this mm-hmm. like that's just like it is pure fun well could you touch on like you're talking about like kind of having to work out the bugs so like or, or reliability issues like what are things that people would run into potentially? Okay, so let's, I guess let's start with the conversion kit because that's kind of the gateway drug into 22 ARs. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, yeah there's a lot of those, ways you can get, sorry to interrupt, there's a lot of ways, and I'm sure people will start to pick this up. There's more than one way to get 22 basically to leave the end of a barrel on an AR platform. So you're, you're going to the conversion kits, which is, is literally where you start out with a 223 AR with the same one in seven twist barrel on the end of it. And you actually just stick something in the upper that turns it into 22 long rifle, right? Right. So there's essentially the same bolt group as the, I call them CMMG style uppers, um, because CMMG is the big player now in those bolts. And it has essentially a, a stainless steel 223 cartridge on the end of it that just slips into the chamber of your 223 or 556 upper. And it allows the 22 long rifle to be chambered and then fire through that adapter. And then it hits the rifling and comes out the end of the barrel. Um, and so I call that the gateway drug because it's like 160 bucks with three mags and, and people grab those um, for cheap plinking. And then like I did, they quickly realize there's a few weaknesses, um, but some of those can be worked out. The biggest problem with the conversion kits is that they essentially free float in the upper. There's nothing constraining that chamber adapter to sit in the chamber other than the back of the the upper where the or the back excuse me the back of the lower where the threads are the top of the bolt does engage with the top of that little ring uh, but there depending on tolerances and depending on the build of your upper there can be anywhere from a 32nd of an inch to a 16th or more there can be a lot of play mm-hmm. um, and so the first thing that that i did was to make a little plug that goes in on top of the buffer that's easily removable. Um, so when you switch back to your center fire, you just pop it out and that pushes everything forward, keeps the chamber adapter seated. And that removes probably 95% of the malfunctions on the conversion kit. Then yeah. after that, you're kind of chasing the law of diminishing returns. Um, and you can upgrade the extractor, upgrade the firing pin, a few other things on that one. Um, but with the conversion kit, it really is a, a diminishing return um, on you know, adding more parts to tune it and people quickly realize that and and then move to a dedicated upper. And when I say dedicated upper, essentially the bolt that has that chamber adapter on it, the adapter gets swapped out for what's called a barrel collar and that engages with a little stub on the end of a 22 barrel that sits inside the upper about an inch and a half, which is another interesting point on the CMMG style rifles is that if you have a 16 inch barrel, it's the equivalent of 14.5 on a center fire because an inch and a half is inside your upper. Mm. Um, so that engages with a barrel stub, and then you have a real 22 barrel with a one in 16 twist and a chamber, you know, for that cartridge. No, no jump to the rifling. Um, when I say jump to the rifling on the adapters, there's a, basically a smooth bore section that's as long as the 20 or the 223 casing. And so you have that, that 22 bullet, which is already about two thousandths undersized for the 223 bore kind of bounces around down this smooth bore tube before it slams into the rifling at I'm approximating around 600 feet per second. So that's where you lose a lot of your accuracy. Mm. Um, people often blame it on the twist and I don't think it's as much the twist as it is the, the jump to the rifling. Yeah. What, because I always thought that was interesting because when you go from, you know, you're in the 223 center fire world and everyone's like, oh, one in seven twist, one in seven twist. That's what you got to have. Maybe one in eight, but one in nine is starting to get a little bit, you know. Um, so then you see the the 22 and the dedicated 22 ARs with the t- uh, 22 barrels and all that stuff. And it's all of a sudden a one in 16 twist. And I remember that that was at first because I wasn't used to, I mean, I have 22s, but I, I I never really paid that much attention to them. You just get a Ruger 1022, and however it is, you just, whatever. I've never checked the twist rate. Right, yeah. And so I'm like, 1 in 16, that seems like super slow. Is that normal? Um, it, what is it with, you know, like when you go all the way down to 1 in 7, that's that's big time change between 1 in 16 and 1 in 7. Yeah, so, so twist rates um, are more dependent on, well, there's two big factors. There's the velocity of the bullet, and there's the length of the bullet. Um, and... 
if you go back to, I think it was like the 1800s when they were first rifling artillery, they had this, this gentleman, I forget his name off the top of my head, but he developed a formula for twist rate. Um, mm. And the inputs are not bullet weight, like people assume that it is, it's bullet length, caliber, mm -hmm. and the velocity of the, the round. And so when you look at it, your average 223 bullet is a 55 grain. It's about twice as long as a, a 22 long rifle bullet, which is just a stubby little solid lead bullet. Um, and so as after you shoot the, the bullet, it comes out with a certain spin. The spin stays, the number of RPMs essentially stays the same, but your velocity drops off. And so your, your stabilization goes down with time. With the 22, you're not really shooting that far out. And so you don't care if it destabilizes at 200 yards and tumbles and falls into the grass. Um, not a big deal. With your center fires, that would be a major problem if, you know, at all of a sudden at 250 yards, the bullet keyholes and you lose all of your accuracy. So that, that's really why they're going towards faster twist rates um, and with in, in center fire. And also the popularity of heavier and longer bullets and all copper bullets, which need a uh, longer or a, a tighter twist. All of those factors are kind of pushing the industry towards one and eight, one and seven. I personally really like one and nine um, because I don't have to shoot those long bullets and I get superb accuracy. And I can notice a drop off in accuracy with my lighter bullets using like hand loads um, with the tighter twist. So. It's not always better to go faster, um, but with something like a 22, not really going to matter. I think if you had a, a barrel chambered in one and nine, it would probably be about as accurate as your bulk pack ammo could do anyway. Um, the only other thing that you may run into is increased leading because you're essentially putting more force and more stress on that lead by asking it to, to spin faster yeah. as it's being put through the barrel. That makes sense. So I think that's why they balanced all of the factors and said, hey, 1 in 16 is great for this this cartridge. That makes well, sense. Yeah. And that makes sense, too. And when you think about, you know, we're talking about 22s. Oh, they're so fun to shoot. Like, you're going to be shooting a lot more volume. Like, or I'd say the average person is going to be shooting a lot more volume. So maybe that's where that slower twist rate comes into play, too. It's like you're talking about that leading. Like, that will happen, I guess, I would assume, like, slower over time. Because, like you said, you're not putting as much stress on the bullet you know forcing it to twist at that higher twist rate makes sense yeah so if all if all the factors are perfect you won't get letting um so i i do a lot of casting and hand loading center fire with cast bullets and if you nail your load you don't get any letting when you get letting you'll look down the bore and you'll see shavings of lead all over the place and it'll build up to the point where you can't put a patch through the barrel and so that's what you're trying to avoid with the 22s because if you shot a thousand rounds and you had the manufacturer of the ammo or the barrel something was off and you got letting you could run into some serious issues um you do get some with the conversion kits right in the cup first couple inches of the barrel where where the bullet slams into the rifling you'll get some letting for about an inch or two because there's just no way to avoid it with a you know bullets not designed to hit rifling at five six hundred feet per second hmm gotcha yeah. Gotcha. Man, I'll, Will, you seem like, a, just already getting this vibe, you seem like a very interesting person, even beyond just what you know about 22 ARs. Right? <laughs> We're already hearing things about your, your loading and your casting of bullets and all this. It's, yeah, this very, uh, it seems it seems like you go uh, pretty pretty far deep into, into guns and things. Classic, yeah. classic engineer. Yeah, classic. Yeah. I always uh, joke with people that some people don't have hobbies because I have all of them. <laughs> <laughs> you just took them all up. You just soaked them all up took like all. a sponge. Yep. Um, but yeah, so, uh, well, and, and another thing you said was very interesting too, where you were kind of saying a lot of people talk about twist rates and weight and I could, you can see how they would do that. Cause oftentimes, you know, you, you in, to increase weight, you increase length. And so some people might just be seeing the weight increasing. They're fitting that the length, length of the, of the projectile is also increasing. Very interesting, uh, interesting points there. Um, what were you going to say, Mark? Well, I've just, uh, Will brought something up that I thought was curious. Uh, you, you'll never believe this, Jim, but before the podcast, I was actually doing a little bit of math. And uh, I just, I found it <laughs> curious because I was like, because I was like, uh, I was looking up the, you know, the conversion kits and dedicated uppers. And I was seeing how like, yeah, I mean, you're just, you know, plugging this thing in and a different mag and off you go. And I was like, eh, whatever. So I was like Googling the diameter of a 22 long versus the di diameter of a, um, you know, five, five, six, two, two, three, and 
well, check my math. But for the 22 long, I came up with 0.223. And for the 5.56 five, or 223, I came up with a diameter of 0.224. Is that correct or incorrect? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, so that's where you were saying, you know, it's kind of almost bouncing down a, a right because it's not actually, you know. So I mean, the, the it con- just didn't seem. Op- I was yeah. like, yeah, that doesn't seem optimal. The phrase "gateway drug" I think is very accurate for the conversion kit thing, and I almost went that route. I was this close to it because you think, I mean, the cool thing about twenty two ARs and and you know, as we kind of get further into it, is that I have this this right here uh, as it's set up as a dedicated twenty two upper. It's clicked onto a standard two twenty three lower. And then, um, Mark, you brought up the fact you just get different magazines. I'm using the Black Dog 22 magazines. Um, I'm even using a standard AR trigger. This was, and Will and I talked about this. I'm sure we'll get into this more when we emailed, but I'm using a Geisley SSAE trigger that I, I have already in the in the lower. So it's, it's really attractive. Um, but, you know, like you also said, if you get that kind of gateway drug option, there's a lot of times, it depends on how far you want to take it. Do you just want to be able to say, oh, watch me shoot 22 through this, bang, 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 bang. Okay, now I'll go back to 223. Or do you want to do something a little bit more with it? And that's where these dedicated setups work out really nice. Now, I've got two on the table here, and I'm sure Will knows far more about them than I do. Uh, two examples. Uh, but the the one that's not attached to a lower... Uh, this is the one that will help me out a great deal on on getting to shoot really reliably. I noticed right out of the box that uh, it was kind of funny when I was charging. You know, it's it's funny. You stick this, uh, you stick this, I guess what is the bolt inside the upper, and it actually doesn't when you shoot. It doesn't go all the way back and push the buffer and the spring back. Right. You know, it all happens inside of the upper. But will I noticed the same thing? Kind of you pointed out initially where a lot of the the issues come from, I was pulling it back to charge it, and I'd noticed the whole thing, like the whole mechanism inside would kind of like scooch its way back a little bit, and then when I'd let go, it all kind of scooch its way back up into the chamber. Uh, that was where the very first thing I got from you was that plug. Um, and even, you know, that, then I, I still noticed that on occasion I get some some issues, and then that's where all these different springs and weights and things came in. Can you explain then what's going on in this particular style uh, of kit and and then we can go into a little bit of how you've optimized it so to speak we got this guy here sure yeah so it looks like you've got the weight installed there behind the bolt i do um, and i've got your little uh little spring or you know the thing that kind of upper pad. yep exactly i've got i've pretty much if it's in will's uh Boar buddy catalog i think i've bought it <laughs> yeah so so like we touched on with the uh, conversion kits there with the dedicated barrels or dedicated uppers there still is the problem of some shifting so that collar is retained by a little ball spring plunger which is essentially like a set screw with a spring loaded um, ball bearing on the end of it and that clicks into a little groove on the barrel stub so that does a pretty good job of locating it but when the bolt cycles and it slams into the back plate of the the bolt group it still does detach that ball spring plunger from the barrel. It, everything moves a little bit, um, and then it slams home, and the bolt coming home has to reseat the collar onto the barrel. Generally, it doesn't really cause a whole lot of issues, especially when it's clean. With these AR-22s, all of your underlying problems don't really come to the surface until you get about 300 rounds through it, hmm. unless with the suppressor. If you're running it suppressed, it's going to be about 100 rounds. And then all of your weaknesses come to the surface as everything starts to gum up a little bit. So then because you, you've you got such light springs, so little um, impulse on the bolts, it's 22 um, to cycle the action, that when you get any grime or gunk in there, you start bleeding away some of that energy on both sides on the impulse um, for the bolt cycling rearward and then on the spring pushing it forward. And at a certain point, you don't have enough force in one direction or the other, and then you get a malfunction. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so that's that's where a lot of the malfunctions come in. Um, when someone contacts me and says, I had X problem, the first thing I always ask is, how dirty was the gun? They'll say, oh, 500, 1,000 rounds. Well, go clean it. And then it <laughs> generally resolves. Um, what the majority of my parts do is to extend that interval of reliability. So a lot of times you won't see any of the major reliability problems until you get a little dirt under there. Um, and even with all the stock parts, um, but then when you get dirt, 
you're going to want things like an extractor that grips a little bit better um, or some more powerful springs on the extractor to make sure that it's actually grabbing the, the casing and pulling it out of the chamber, especially on live rounds. Um, that's the big extraction weakness is you go to clear the rifle, rack the charging handle back. You know, if you don't look and you don't check, you think it's clear, but the extractor will slip right over the rim and there'll be a live round in the chamber mm. um, when it's dirty. Um, and that's and that was what my extractor spring design and extractor was meant to avoid because um, I found myself digging live shells out of my chamber with the pocket knife at the range. And that's not a good place to be, um, not a comfortable place to be. And so that was that was really the driving factor on the extractor. The pressure plug we covered, the charging handle insert is, is another one that's for the conversions oh, yeah. more than the dedicated groups. Um, and that essentially fills the, the, the little channel and the charging handle up with a piece of plastic so that your gas tube doesn't dump gas right back in your face when you're shooting. So that was my other main gripe with the conversion kit was I, if I wasn't, if I wasn't wearing really, really good safety glasses, my eyes would burn and I yeah. found that unpleasant. Um, <laughs> it, it was about like shooting a suppressed gun. And I don't want that, you know, if you're shooting a suppressed center fire, you expect that. But on a 22, it's not something you expect to happen. Right. So that was the, the solution for that. And that's been great, um, even though I don't shoot conversions anymore. But Right. You don't have to worry about that so much. It doesn't seem like when you're uh, just shooting the regular dedicated 22s because they're just a blowback. There's no gas tube that you have to worry about or anything like that, right? Right. And the gas tube is non-functional in a, in a conversion. All right. it does is vent gas from your your bore and it goes nowhere except in your face. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> the only thing that the charging handle does insert does accomplish on a dedicated group is it stops what I call the death jam. I don't know if you've had the death jam where the casing goes up between the bolt and the front of the charging handle and it locks your, your gun up. And so you, you pull in the charging handle and nothing happens because you've got a, a casing between. So then you have to get some type of tool and pull the bolt back. So it slides in the charging handle and let the casing fall out. Wow, I have um, not yet had the death jam. Thankfully, yeah, I've only had one. I've only had one death jam personally, and it was last weekend. So oh, I was no out shooting with a buddy, and I said, "Look at this, a death jam." <laughs> and the charging handle, the charging handle insert had had slipped back, and the casing went went up in there. Because um, I'd probably had I don't know a thousand rounds on that rifle without cleaning or any attention. Yeah. So it started to have issues. So that so that's interesting though. So yeah, that that charging that charging handle plugged in will help mitigate that, even if it's not necessarily yeah. handling that uh, potential gas coming into your face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and it's a super rare malfunction. I mean, I've gotten one in probably ten thousand rounds, um, but it is something that if you're not really familiar with what it is, it looks like it's a unrecoverable malfunction uh, because okay. we're used to grabbing the charging handle, pulling it back, clearing everything out. And then all of a sudden, charging yeah. handle doesn't do anything. It moves a quarter of an inch, and then that's it. Charging handle is like the clutch in a manual transmission car. It just it gets you out of everything. <laughs> oh my gosh! I'm, I'm freaking out. Just yeah, just pull the charging handle. Um, Question on on cleaning and maintenance, which I don't care for. Uh, <laughs> how often would you recommend with with a with a twenty two, like actually getting in there and giving it a a good cleaning? Um, so typically, I will clean the bore after every shooting outing um if i've shot more than maybe 200 rounds that's kind of a with 22s I, i'm a little bit more lax on cleaning as well just because it doesn't really make any difference until it starts causing problems um so sometimes it's every couple hundred rounds if i feel like it or if it's when the casings start to get sticky the bolt group is really easy because I have an ultrasonic cleaner, just a Harbor Freight special for, you know, 70 bucks. And I just nice. put a little bit of dish soap nice. in some water and toss it in there, turn it on. Sometimes I'll pull the firing pin and extractor. Sometimes I won't even do that. Um, just let it run and then uh, dry it off with a hot air gun or a blow dryer or something and oil it up and you're good to go on that. Um, a deep cleaning, I've maybe done it twice or three times on my main rifle that's got tens of thousands of rounds on it where you pull everything down and scrub it out with a toothbrush it really doesn't cause a whole lot of issues um it's just a 22 and the bolt group is what matters and that's really the place that this platform shines over something like a 1022 or a model 60 is that you just 
pop the lower and upper apart, rip the bolt out, throw it in an ultrasonic cleaner, walk away, do something else, come back 10 minutes later and oil it up and you're good. That is nice. Um, one of the, uh, one of the things you were mentioning, what made me think of it is when you were talking about cleaning. Oh, well, you, you know, just the fact that this being a 22, um, you know, I mean, a lot of us are so used to, if it's your hunting rifle, it's your, if it's your home defense gun, if it's your concealed carry, you can't go until it doesn't work, right? Like, that's just a bad idea, right? But when it's a twenty two, it's just like, I don't know, I'll just keep shooting it. If it stops working while I'm shooting it, chances are my life's not in danger. So I'll just then address it, you know? So that's, that is kind of one of the nice things, I suppose. Right. But. The, the biggest pitfall on the Air 22s is that if you let it go too long and you start it, and you ignore warning signs, warning signs are mostly light strikes. Um, if mm. you start ignoring light strikes and you have four or five, 600 rounds through the rifle, you're going to get at some point an out of battery detonation. Um, because especially if you're not running our weights. So this gets into the main drawback of this bolt design is that there is a ton of bolt bounce, um, enough that I've seen it extract a live round, um, from the bounce. Oh my gosh. That's it. yeah. So we have some slow motion footage that shows, shows it generally it bounces back about the length of the casing. And so occasionally you'll get it extract a, uh, a round and it'll flip sideways and jam. And it looks like some type of weird failure to feed, but it's actually a, an extraction of, of a live round from bolt bounce. Wow. Um, so the, if you're not running the weight, which the weight gets rid of the bolt bounce, essentially 99% of the bolt bounce is gone. If you're not running that, what happens is your rifle starts to get dirty. The chamber gets a little tighter. It chambers around, it bounces back, it pulls that round out. Now the spring only has about a half an inch of compression on it. So you're not getting a lot of energy to reseat that round. So then it goes to reseat after the bounce and it leaves it hanging out a 16th of an inch. You pull the trigger and usually you'll get a light strike. Sometimes you'll get a, a normal fired round, but you pick the casing up and it's bulged. And then sometimes it'll rupture at the rim. Yeah. Um, it doesn't so have our firing pin does our firing pin design was designed to mitigate that a little bit by tapering the back end. So it would, the hammer would contact the bolt rather than the firing pin when it's slightly out of battery. Um, but it's not hundred percent. And so I'll get customers asking me to cut, um, the forward assist notches on the weight. And I say, absolutely not. Because if you're needing to use a forward assist, you need to clean really badly or you're going <laughs> to get an out of battery detonation. And that's not a fun day. It doesn't usually break anything in these rifles. But, you know, if you're not doing your due diligence and wearing eye protection or there's people around you, it's just not something you want. So I say, let's stop talking, go get your cleaning kit out, and then this problem will go away. Yeah, even if you make it out of that perfectly unscathed, you, you just don't want to be that guy. No, know? no, that's not good for anybody. No. Um, but, yeah, no, it, it is very interesting. I mean, it, I... I remember actually, because we had a couple email conversations, I remember I was having a few issues. First off, I think, was um, was the problem of just failure to feeds or failure to eject or something like that. It's kind of pretty common stuff, I think, before I really put any of your upgrades in. And then I remember I was having some of the... Uh, some of the problem where I was just getting like a dead, a dead click or like a, uh, you, you know, it would, it would chamber around, I'd go to pull the trigger and just nothing would happen. I remember that was what was happening. And then that was where we would kind of went crazy and we threw the whole, uh, we threw the whole catalog at it and, and <laughs> it just doesn't happen anymore. Um, but was that kind of one of the things that you were getting at there with just kind of like a, a dead, just nothing happens? So a dead trigger usually is some type of cycle failure where you don't get a reset on the hammer for one reason or another. Yeah. Um, this happens a lot in people that have full auto lowers or some of those forced reset triggers um, because you'll be running, they're, they're all running the weight because you have to to get them to even run. And so if you, if you set the adjustable weight up with that's got a bunch of little internal weights, you can take a plate off and switch them around and, and adjust anywhere from about an ounce up to close to three ounces. So if you're running it too heavy and you're using something like a, a subsonic CCI quiet, that type of thing, you're not going to get full cycling and hammer reset. So that's usually what gives you a dead trigger. Um, with a full auto or a forced reset trigger, you can also, or a binary if you're really fast, you can also get a dead trigger if the hammer falls on, on the bolt as it's bouncing. So if you're not running a weight, and oh. the bolt bounces back the length of like a 22 casing, 
then you have the hammer fall on something that's very, very far out of battery. The hammer just follows, hits the bolt, follows it home, and then you, you get what looks like a light strike, but it's just hammer follow. I think that's probably what was happening to me. Gotcha. Um, I got a question. Send it. The uh, the weight the the weights that you're talking about can you can you essentially like just kind of customize those to the ammo like if you're like oh I feel Mark. like shooting a bunch of Hear subs this. today can you just swap those in and out to cater to what you're going to be shooting got this set up right yes. here Mark okay I'm, I'm yeah so there's a, basically an there's influencer. a plate on the back and you remove the screws and then those the internal weights drop out and there's a bunch of different materials that we supply with that and so you can swap them out and change the uh, the weight of the overall system. Yeah. So then if you have a couple different ammos you like to run, you just get it running perfectly with whatever weight and then note down your combination of, of material types inside and then you're off to the races. Are, or if are, you're lazy, you, you get two weights and have one for each. Nah, that makes more sense to me. Um, what, what about, are, is there, speaking of, I guess, ammo, are there, you know, I th- yeah, there's I'm definitely different ammo. grades of... 22 long right is there you know i guess if you're gonna like if they're if you're gonna put them in buckets of like good better best are you better off running kind of higher quality ammo in this system i mean you're always better off running higher quality ammo but i search i search for the bottom of the barrel personally um because i like to solve problems and the i had a whole bunch of um arms core 36 grain and it was a bad lot. Usually that stuff's pretty good. It's, it's very waxy. It's very dirty, but I got a really bad lot of it. And rather than sending it back to arms core and getting it replaced, I threw it in the, in the stash as this is great testing ammo because it, the primers are, are half primed sometimes like it'll, it'll fire on one side of the rim and not the other. Hmm. And so it's basically just a worst case scenario. So it's been a great lot of ammo to have for testing. Um, but no, personally, I just, I try and make a rifle that, that shoots the junk ammo so to speak the best it shoots it fine and if you chase the bottom of the barrel ammo then it'll run great with the nice stuff there you go that's fair that's fair what if you did have your choice like you're like okay i'm not testing now i'm going out for me this is personal time i'm gonna do some shooting what, <laughs> this just got personal yeah what uh what <laughs> ammo what ammo would you like to uh run in that scenario i i have a whole bunch of the aguila um, 38 grain hollow point that stuff's great Cool. That's it's a cheap ammo. It runs pretty well. Um, I don't mind running arms core as well uh, because cheap ammo runs well. I don't really run a lot of CCI just because of availability and um, it's hard to buy in in case quantities. But I think a a Gila would probably be my go to. It's just a good all around. I used to go for the federal bulk packs, but those are essentially you have to find those locally and they're hard to find. Yeah. Are we, are, you're not going to take us off the topic of ammo. No, no one uh, still to on. The ammo. Still right, on. Great, thanks. Uh, you may have already answered this, but like, okay, so I've got a, a 10-22, and I've got some of those, like, gosh, Agila, Subsonic, I don't know, I think they're like 68 grainers. I mean, the bullet, the bullet sticks oh, the out and is like longer. Sniper Subsonic, yep. Yes, I've got those. So when I shoot those, like, in my 10-22, like, it, it'll still shoot it, but it becomes like a... It's a bolt uh, action. Uh, yeah, it's like a, a straight pull. <laughs> a straight you know? pull, yeah. Uh, can you make those work in this, or are those just like they don't have enough juice? No, those have a lot of juice. Um, the problem with those is that they have a 22 short casing. Right. They've got a big old lead bullet with a 22 short casing. So you can get a ton of port pop. You can get um, a lot of issues with gas spewing into your action and making it really dirty really quick. Um, but they don't know they'll run great in the, in the AR 22s. They take a little bit of tinkering and they really like a heavy weight behind them. Oh, interesting. But, you know, but if you're running those in a one in 16, don't shoot them through your can unless you're really confident they're going to stabilize. Okay. Gotcha. Why won't it, uh, make my, uh, my 10 22. Why won't it cycle then? Who knows? I don't own a 10 22. So Damn I'm a, it. I'm a unicorn. <laughs> we yeah, found you them. really are. We found them. Well, I tell you what, the guy casts his own bullets, but he doesn't have a ten twenty two. Very unicorn and, um, status. Comment below if you know what's <laughs> wrong with my <laughs> rifle. <laughs> um, yeah, when was the last no. time you cleaned it? Oh, it's that's Mark. A, I, I can question. give you the answer if it's <laughs> Mark. That's it's, a real good question. The answer First is no. question right there. <laughs> the answer is that never. Might be what's wrong with your ten twenty two? I'm definitely not blaming Ruger on this one. I'll tell you that. 
<laughs> I've been using out of mine. I've been using if I now I do have a can on on this gun. Now this gun I got the, and part of the reason also I wanted to go the twenty two route is because I wanted to do some shooting at night outside. So that, you naturally know, you can go very quietly. Uh, now if I'm shooting it with the can on, the ammo that I that I have the most of is is still kind of you know not super quiet. But I have the CCI tactical stuff. Uh, it literally has an AR looking thing on the box. So, uh, you know, it has to say it on the box. <laughs> um, but, uh, I don't know if you've had any luck with, with stuff like that. Is that stuff? All right. That's the, that's the 45 grain mm-hmm. subsonics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so those, this, those... this stuff's not subsonic. Sorry. It's 40 grain okay. and it's, uh, it's like a thousand fifty feet per second or something like that. Yeah. That stuff runs fine. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times people will shy away from standard velocity, but it's just a tuning issue. So these so these bolts on the AR-22s, the CMMG style ones, are underweight from the factory. I think they're mm-hmm. about four four point nine ounces. A 1022 is a little over six. So a 1022 is rather heavy. So that might be the reason you have some issues with cycling certain ammunition types. So that would be like running an AR-22 with our weight set up as heavy as it'll go. Gotcha. Certain stuff is not going to run very well. Um, but if you run standard velocity, you'll just want to pull some of those weights out and stick in like the aluminum ones. And generally you're good. The other big factor that comes into play is the barrel length. So the shorter the barrel is, the less impulse you're getting on the bolt. And so the relatively hotter the ammo needs to be to get cycling all else held constant. Oh, okay. Got it. That's good to know. So that- that's a problem that people run into is they say, well, I got a 16 inch conversion. It runs this stuff, no problem. And then I built a dedicated upper with a 4.5 inch, you know, to keep everything subsonic on my can and nothing cycles. Well, it's because your barrel is so much shorter that you're not getting nearly as much impulse on the bolt. So you need to lighten the bolt weight up a little bit and then everything will be, be good again. Okay. Um, so we actually have two versions of the adjustable bolt weight. One that's got an aluminum body that's aimed straight at the 4.5 inch builds. Okay. So it gives you a little bit more adjustment capability without starting at like a one ounce added weight. You start at about half an ounce. Now everybody knows how much Mark and I like tinkering around with things and in, in, including guns and, you know, and reloading and all that stuff. So I know Mark was really, was really ribbing me when I got into 22s and I'm like, yeah, well, Mark, 22s are super awesome. We got to do a podcast about it because I had to buy these weights and these springs and this other stuff. <laughs> Mark was like, I don't know, man, this doesn't sound like you. I think you got body snatched. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you, you know, you got to be kind of ready. I think that's the biggest thing is is if you're going to go into this 22 AR world, you got to be ready to maybe do a little tweaking because depending, like you just mentioned, even they're just barrel length of the ammo that you're using. Um, there's a lot of different things uh, that can kind of that can kind of factor in. You want to be ready to maybe do a little tweaking if you want it to be running super reliably. Um but uh, so we've been talking a lot about this particular style, it, it, you know, the CMMG style, more of a dedicated. It's not a conversion. It's it's a dedicated uh, 22 setup. Now there's there's a couple others. In in one is just we haven't talked about it yet, but I mean it's just extremely prevalent, which is like the Smith and Wesson M&P 22. I think that's a different style altogether, is it not? They kind of have their own system going with that rifle. Yeah. It's its own beast. Um, I actually just picked one of those up a couple of days ago to tinker around with, and it is a totally different machine. I don't, I don't even know if it takes standard AR triggers. And the magwell is a different dimension. It's a plastic lower and a plastic upper, um, and it's just, it's, it's essentially like buying an off-the-shelf 1022. Is you buy it for what it is, you use it, you have fun. Um, whereas these are, you know, for the tinkerer is right. what what the, these ARs are are great for. It's like Legos for for adults. Um, it's true, but yeah, that's, it's their own thing. The same thing with a, a Tipman. I've got another one of those behind me. It's kind of their own system. The Magwell is a little bit more of a standard dimension on that one, but the bolt's different. Um, and then like your Nordic components or Bear Creek Arsenal now has one that's essentially a Nordic components, um, style. I just call those, I call those like the collar extractor 10 to, or AR 22s. Okay. So the difference between those is they've got a, the extractor, or sorry, not extractor, ejector is, a, is attached to the barrel or to the collar, whereas with the CMMG style, the ejector is on the rails. Sure, sure, so yeah. You, so, yeah, yeah if that's... you pull that bolt back, you'll see it. I'm going to do it here. This is uh, safe and all that good stuff for those who are always... Always watching. Always watching. Okay. 
Yeah, see, this is, uh, so this one here is the, the Nordic uh, dedicated 22 upper. And it's just, it's just interesting. I got this one because I heard about it through our very own Ryan Muckenhern. Um, and he was just saying like, oh yeah, that's just another variant. And so I kind of got this one to test it out, try it out. So I have the one that I've already gotten working perfectly. And this one thus far has worked out pretty well. I did put the plug behind this as well though, uh, from, from Will, uh, and Borbuddy because that, that did help. You can even see it kind of move a little bit, uh, in this system. So that is still important, but. And so like, no matter what you do with like all the stuff and the weights, the plug is still a good idea. Like. No matter, seems like it seems like is that yeah, it never hurts. Okay, yeah, I do like the only thing that you can. The only thing you want to avoid is if you're using the same lower for center fire, take it out before you touch off a center fire because it will restrict the motion of the bolt carrier. Oh yeah, absolutely. You'd want to make sure you do that if you have a conversion. Uh, Very convenient that you also make them for the law uh, folder thing. Uh, because that is what I had when I saw that you sold the, I, I found that thing online, you know, uh, and I was like, Oh, this is awesome. And then I was looking at it and I'm like, I bet it won't work with a, with the law folder. But sure enough, I went online, I'm clicking around. There it is. There's one specifically for it. Uh, so you just make sure you get the right one, but it's all, uh, it's all pretty slick. I like these versions, the ones that are actually, you know, like in this case, you know, my, uh, this one was from Palmetto. This is a regular AR upper. I put a, a regular AR forend on it or hand guard. Uh, and then the one from Nordic here is kind of, you kind of have to get the whole kit. You have to get the upper just as they sell it. So it comes with the hand guard. You're kind of, uh, I believe you're sort of married to that. Uh, but it just kind of comes already all done. I like it. I haven't changed anything. It looks sweet. But it's made of metal. It goes on a regular standard AR metal lower. Um, and then you, you stick those, at least in my case, I'm using the black dog magazines. Are there any other magazines that are like, uh, uh highly recommended or, or that can fit in these? Will? so I run Smith and Wesson M and P 1522 mags in mine. Um, I, I also have the black dogs and the CMMG mags, but the 1522 mags, you can get an adapter that makes them, um, run in a regular lower. It's yeah. called a better mag adapter and it gives you last round bolt hold open and your bolt catch works. Oh, so wow. then you can reload oh, really? and slam the bolt catch and and be back. back well, now, it. now I wish I had that. Yeah, and I just can... spent another forty dollars of your money there. Well, yeah, you did. Thanks a lot. <laughs> um, but that only works with those Smith and Wesson magazines, then. Yeah, those are nice though. Um, they've got a little thumb assist for loading, so you can load them up really easily without having to push really hard on the the last five or so of the yeah. you know into the twenty five round mag, and they just they the, that actually removes a lot of your failure to feed malfunctions because the geometry with the adapter is just a little bit better. The Black Dog and the CMMG mags they rock back and forth in the mag well quite a bit, and it'll actually change your feed geometry by five ten degrees depending on if you're holding on to it or you're resting on a table or. That seems significant. Yeah, if you inserted a mag into that and you pushed it forward and back, you see that the bottom of a twenty five round mag will move like a half an inch. I didn't realize that either. Boy. Learning all sorts of. Just when I thought I had this thing like dialed in, now I just now it's I for ch- the tinkerer, now Jim. I'm gonna change it. What about so if a person you know like I said Jim, you've got these running smooth, right? But maybe maybe you've gotten it running not using suppressor. Maybe you've been waiting on a suppressor, then you finally get your suppressor. Are there? Is it just put the suppressor on and you're and you're good to go, or are there things that you're gonna want to change when you are shooting suppressed? Maybe we covered some of this already. I just wanted to ask that though. Yeah, essentially, it's just screw it on and go. If you have a four point five inch barrel, it it gives you a little bit more push on the bolt for cycling, so it can help things a bit. But yeah, screw it on and go. Okay, right on. I like that. And then and then cleaning. Is it just gonna? Is it gonna have? You're going to have to clean it more frequently when you shoot it suppressed oh, then? Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, it'll get nasty after a couple boxes, 100, 150 rounds. Okay. Gotcha. I have noticed that these get quite smelly when I'm shooting them with the can. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're a ton of fun. I really like shooting these things. I'm glad that there are people like Will who, uh, who help make oh my them gosh. Really better. Yeah. Uh, must be fun being an engineer. Just, oh, a problem. I'll solve it. Uh, just like that. I like that. I mean, it's, uh, it's all, pl- I, I would assume, I don't know. I mean, you work with the edge guys downstairs, Jim, but like to me, intuitively, they seem like they make an excellent trainer. 
Yeah, I think they do, and especially if you can get that thing that, uh, Will, you were talking about, where you can then even, uh, it has last round bolt hold open, and you get to use your uh, your bolt catch and all that stuff. I mean, then literally, yeah, me... you have all the same uh, controls. Will's going to go over and grab one of the guns uh, for, uh, behind him here. But, I mean, if you have literally all the same controls, yeah, sure, you know, the the recoil and the noise, I mean, whatever it is, there's always going to be little differences, but I've, I've found it to be a, a really great little uh, little training tool. So here's a Smith & Wesson mag. Sure enough. And you see the little thumb assist for loading. What's different is it has this this little piece here that moves with the spring. Mm -hmm. And that pushes up on your bolt catch. Okay. And so, empty. Yep, so then the bolt locks open. That's nice. And then I can that catch and it just releases. That is pretty cool. Yeah, and there's a little mag. You probably can't see it in there, but there's a little silver piece. That okay. adapts to those magazines. Okay. Really cool. Yeah, I, I know a lot of the guys down at Edge when I brought this thing in when it was kind of all tuned up and everything. They were making fun of me at first when it wasn't tuned they up were. properly. Oh yeah. Oh they'll, yeah. They, like, they'll take any chance uh, right. to, to give you, you know. But uh once I got it running well, I mean everybody was having a great time with it. And it's so fun to shoot, you know, in this case I've got kind of a uh it's all relative, you know, in the world of night vision, but I've kind of got a, a relatively inexpensive night vision set up on it. So you could go out and uh, you know, uh, shoot outside, like I was mentioning, or inside when we have our range where we can actually dim the lights down. You can actually do all the night vision stuff um, very quietly, very easily, send a lot of rounds uh, without you know having to spend a ton of money on ammo and all that stuff. So um, it's great. I love these things. I shoot them, like Will mentioned, more than I shoot my regular 223 ARs just because it's just more fun. I mean, I haven't, I mean, I've obviously shot 22s, haven't shot one of these yet, but even just, I remember the day, you're like, dude, Mark, I'm going way deep in this 22 AR rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> we got to do a podcast on, I'm like, hey, do you got a guy? You're like, yeah, I got a guy. And uh, that guy is Will. And Will, you were the guy. You are the man for the job on this one. This has been super enlightening, super interesting, and also super... I guess in some ways, fortunately and unfortunately, inspiring, Jim, because now both of you guys have me wanting one of these, and you uh, I think I think I will. I, I'm not. You could probably it. get away with shooting it in your backyard, in your neighborhood. Now I'm really sold. I mean, you you know, I wouldn't admit it. If you did do it, I wouldn't say. No, it out I never. Loud, you know, I never would. Just the idea just saying, of it. Yeah, the idea that you could. Right. It's yeah. always the knowing that you could. <laughs> Uh, we should yeah, and once stop. you once you really get some uh, get into it, then just get a, a registered full auto lower, and then the rabbit hole goes even deeper. Oh my gosh! Oh dear, that would be something. Dare to do you? How many, so? Do you have some customers that have full, full auto twenty two builds that they're rocking with? That has yeah, to be. Yeah, and I get I get invited out to shoot them occasionally, and I've done it. Um, I went out to Texas last year and shot full autos with some customers, and a 22 full auto is it's like a, a garden hose of lead it doesn't move around you just kind of point it at what you want to hit and <laughs> squeeze the trigger and go <laughs> does anybody make a uh, a 22 lr ar drum mag yet is that a thing yet yeah, i think black dog makes them 50 rounds oh my gosh i need to look into that if i there well, used to if... be a built bed upper too but those are out of production but there still are some floating around it's like a cloth belt and you just stick 22s into it and you can have a couple hundred of them Oh my gosh! Ready to go! Wow. Unbelievable. Well, that sounds like something that uh, you know, you being the engineer. Uh, when you're an engineer, it's kind of like having a pickup truck. Everyone's like, "Hey, I got an idea. You should make it." <laughs> uh, but yeah, maybe maybe that's your next thing. Belt feds. Um, that would be fantastic. I'd line up. I'm for it. Yeah, especially if the force reset trigger survives all of the, the scrutiny it's getting right now, then that would be a very fun toy. Absolutely. At a relatively low price point for people. Absolutely, it would. Not that we recommend everybody try this, but I know you mentioned, and even our, our guy here, Ryan Muckiner, who's kind of a gun nerd, mentioned polishing feed ramps, potentially, as being one one potential thing to do. Uh, so is it all right if we kind of hit on those real quick? It never hurts anything. Um, so a Dremel with a polishing pad. I like the cone-shaped ones and a little bit of grinding compound and some light pressure take all the machining marks out of that and that gets rid of the occasional 
I call it the nose up failure to feed where the top of the bullet just slams into the front, the top of the upper receiver. And then the bolt closes on the, the shell. Okay. okay. Um, it's Sweet. free. If you have a Dremel and, and polishing compound, if not, it's a couple bucks and it's time spent well spent five minutes. Okay. And, By and the then way. if you're going crazy on that, you might as well just polish the rails up, polish all the sliding surfaces. And that, that takes it, to a whole new level where you can run stuff that you wouldn't be able to run before. Um, mostly lower pam- powered ammo. Cause yeah. we, like we talked about at the very beginning of the podcast, you're not bleeding off as much energy with that bolt bumping over machining marks as it slides. Then you can also say you have a hand polished 22 AR, which is kind of, you know, yeah, you can hang out yeah. with all the 1911 guys then. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hand lapped. That's right. That's right. Now, if that transition, by the way, into this topic was a little bit herky jerky, it's because I completely forgot uh, originally to ask a couple of questions. So right now we're talking about feed ramps. Um, but Will, just two for reference uh, for people. So when you have a, a 22 AR like this, now at least the one that I have here, this is again, this is I got it from Paul Meadow. It's kind of a dedicated 22 upper. Um, it had this bolt system in it that we've been talking a lot about. Now, it has this kind of, uh, uh, where you normally see, well, I guess you normally wouldn't see anything on a 20, uh, 223 centerfire AR. There's this little piece sticking out here, kind of from the barrel extension. Now, in that is sort of your feed ramp, if I'm not mistaken. Is that where it is, or is it actually back here on the... It's on, on the, the collar. Board? Oh, so it's on the collar itself. Got it. And so yeah, that so you can... see it hanging off the bottom there. There it is. Yeah, you're right. Okay. So that can be a little bit sharp, essentially. And so as your round is making its way from the magazine and then up into the chamber, if that's a little bit sharp or there's kind of an edge on it, it can kind of catch your bullet, which can... What, what potential problems would that uh, cause? Just a decreased accuracy or something? Yeah. Let me grab a collar. So here's a stock collar from CMMG. You can see the feed ramp here. Sure. Mm-hmm. When you polish that, this one's been polished. But you just want to polish this surface, the rounded surface. Right. Where that um, you don't want to go too hard and start changing geometries. Um, but yeah, it just it just smooths it up a little bit and makes it so it's the bullet slides more smoothly over it. Here's one that you may be able to see a few tooling marks on. Oh, I think I polished. can't. It's like yeah, tough. But yeah. I think actually I could there. And then these are our quiet collars, which have a polymer buffer on them. So if you're running a suppressor, that takes the bolt noise out. Oh, yeah, yeah, but that's right. I remember it, seeing that on your website, yeah. Yeah, so same idea. Basically, the idea is that you want to have your bullet's first interaction with the firearm out of the magazine not be, like, immediately going into, like, a sharp edge or something, right? Exactly, yeah. And then the other problem that you can run into, this one you have to be really careful with, um, and it's not recommended unless you know what you're doing, but some barrels, the chambers are cut with a square edge between the edge of the chamber and the the breech face. Ah, that's some what I was thinking of. Yeah. Ramp that, um, and some don't. I think mostly just for manufacturing expediency. But you can radius that, like a radius of five or ten thousandths, really, really light, just on the bottom edge. If you go too aggressively, you can get casings that bulge, kind of like a an unsupported Glock chamber on the 40s, yeah. where you get a, a little bulge in the casing. But that will Im- improve your free your feeding um, just immensely. Hmm. Okay. So I know that CMMGs generally aren't ramped too aggressively. Um, the right to bear barrels are, are generally square cut. A few others are square cut. Um, Lothar Walther, they used to ramp. They don't do AR-22 barrels anymore. Um, buyer ramps, a few people ramp. Um, but that makes a big difference. So if you're getting shells that if you eject a, a live round and there's it looks like the the front of the bullet has slammed into something and there's a little nick in the lead. That's because the chamber is a square cut corner. Okay. That's what I was thinking of when I was kind of pointing back here at the barrel. Yeah, that, that would be uh, pretty cool to do. But like you said, it's not something that, you know, if you've only just heard about this process or anything like that, it, you may not be in the demographic of people who should attempt that in your, in yeah. Your or kitchen. if you, if you don't mind replacing a barrel right away when you go too aggressively. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's, there's two ways that you can learn how to do things, Mark. And both of them cost you either A, you pay somebody to teach you how to do it, or B, you try and do it yourself without, you know, learning first, and then you wind up just paying with all, you know, for all the parts that you broke. Yeah. Well, you might learn it either way. Um, so anyway, so that was that was one of the two questions that I missed. The other one question that I missed before um, is triggers. 
Uh, I kind of alluded to it at one point because I was mentioning how this is a standard AR lower. It's got a Geisley SSAE trigger in it, like I used, like I like to run with a lot of other regular centerfire rifles. Um, but I, I, one of the email conversations Will and I had at one point, you know, I asked him if my trigger was maybe causing any issues, and I think Will, you were even like, no, actually, that trigger is super awesome because you've tested almost like every trigger, uh, or that, at least yeah, it seemed I've- that way. So I've tested um, vicariously through a bunch of people having lots of problems with cartridge triggers. So the (laughs) drop-in triggers, those do not play well with the 22s. Um, We have never bought and tested them because we know they don't work. Um, But the mil-spec type triggers, the Geisleys are all great geometry for the 22s. The LaRue MBT two-stage is another good one Mm -hmm. geometry-wise. All the mil-spec triggers run pretty well. Um, the, the, really the problem is between the geometry of the bolt and the geometry of the hammer. So on a center fire, the hammer resets on kind of a long ramp surface at the back of the bolt carrier. Whereas on the 22s, it's, it's like a pretty sharp edge. It's got a radius on it, but it's an edge. So it's essentially slamming into a, a little angle change on the bolt, little edge and resetting the hammer. Whereas, so it's like a, a slap instead of a push. Hmm. Um, like the center fires. And so they're a little bit more geometry um, sensitive on the triggers. So we'll, I'll, I'll have a customer be, maybe this happens on a weekly basis is someone's really at the, their wits end trying to figure out what's wrong. And then it turns out they've got something like a, a Timney cartridge trigger or a hyper fire or one of those drop in styles. Yeah. And then as soon as you rip that out and put in a, a mil spec style that has, you know, the two pins and the multiple pieces, most of the, if not all the problems just go away Hmm. almost like magic. Now it seems like there are people out there who are using these 22 AR uppers and stuff like that with some of these real fancy triggers. Like we mentioned the, uh, we mentioned the, the binary triggers or whatever that kind of make you shoot fast or whatever. They're kind of all slick. Um, is there a way to make them work or is it just kind of, Hey, that's cool. You got that trigger. Just be aware that something's probably eventually going to go wrong. That's kind of like, you said earlier, you know, do you want to play around and replace a trigger? <laughs> oh, I mean, you can, okay. You can make you can make all kinds of modifications. So, I'm I'm guessing that if someone gave me a Timney and said I don't want this back, make it run, I could probably get a Dremel or a mill and change the geometry a little bit and get it running. But it's just a lot of work for very little return. Um, when something like the Larue MBT is eighty bucks, if not less, on sale, or a mil spec trigger is essentially free because we all have them in our parts bins yeah i mean yeah you're you're not wrong yeah okay that's good to know sweet but yeah the ssae is the best trigger i've found well in general i really like those triggers but with the 22s they just run and the break is crisp the reset is crisp the larue is great too it's got a good break it's got two two different springs so if you use a heavy one it's got a crisp reset but then you've got like a five and a half pound trigger if you use the light one, the reset's a tad bit sloppy, but if you're not rattling off shots really fast, it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. But the SSAE is a sweet running little trigger. Yeah. Usually things don't work out like that for me. Usually I go out and I get something thinking it's great, and then somebody tells me I got the totally wrong thing, so I have to get a new thing. In this case, I went out and got something that actually happened, just happened to be pretty sweet that's why you know so many yeah. things though jim because you got to <laughs> figure all this stuff <laughs> i'm out. the guy who never actually formally learned anything yeah it's all learned <laughs> through breaking things uh, well, that's the yes. best way to do it though is self-taught you don't have i like to say so i'm i got into this industry without working for a firearms company ever and so i like to say that i have a bit of i have a lot of disadvantages because i just don't know how a lot of the industry works you know i'm coming in as as someone who's fairly green but I also don't have my engineering process polluted by someone else's, you know, for lack of a better term, like this is how it's always been done and this is how it has to be done. Type oh, of yeah. Thinking where for you'll sure. get potted down by your boss and and you do it the way that it's done and that's how it is and don't step outside the bounds. Absolutely. No, that's helpful because, I, I mean, that stuff is completely stifling. I mean, if you just always, if you always get stuck on how things were always done, I mean, things are kind of going to kind of always look the same. Yep. So, but going back to what you said of, can it be made to run? I would say yes, because the fancy triggers are drop in cartridge triggers, like the rare breed and the wide open trigger and the binary triggers. And I know customers have used our parts and they have gotten it to run. That's probably 80% of my email volume um, because it's (laughs) just very, very troublesome, but it can be done. And those guys are 
you know, more willing to just like break out a Dremel or a, a mill and just cut something that needs to be cut or modify and, and not worry about breaking things and replacing them. My kind of people. I am not that guy. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah. you're not. Mark. Uh, I'll give you my Geisley trigger when you finally build one of these things. Then I'll go. I'll grab my Dremel and a and a fancy trigger. Perfect. Uh, cool. No, this is awesome. Uh, appreciate you jumping back on because yes. this was. No I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad we did it, Jim. Indeed, hundred percent worth it. MC Ryan, good luck. Now we're going to magically jump into the rest of the podcast that that we originally did. Cool. Well. I think we've pretty much touched on a lot of stuff. That's 22 AR. Maybe there's stuff left, uh, and I'm sure that our listeners, if there are things that we missed, they will make it known, yes. which we very much love about our listeners. Thank you for that on yes. Instagram or in the YouTube comments. Um, but yeah, Will, awesome awesome having you on. Uh, we may bug you, maybe even in the future, to come on again. Who knows? Because you sound like a very interesting person, even beyond the 22 stuff like we've already addressed. But, um, but we'll have yeah, Send me an email list of topics and... We'll talk about them. Cool. I love. It. We'll have him back on when he's got the uh, the whole uh, belt fed thing right, ironed right. out. Yeah, just let us know. But uh, no, super, super awesome. Will, like I said, super insightful. I've crossed everything off my list. If you haven't, and I'm talking to the listeners out there, if you haven't crossed everything off your list, and you do have a question, like Jim said, let us know, and uh, we'll get back with Will. There's that. All yeah, right. and I'll and I'll cruise around in the comments a little bit under the video on wherever you post it, YouTube and Instagram, and see if I can answer a few questions if I see something. Good deal. Thank awesome, you. man. Appreciate, Appreciate that. Appreciate it. All right. Well, everybody, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for listening, as usual. Bye. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.